All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And we're off for part four of our discourse on the excellence of wisdom, <laughs> the paramita of wisdom. In particular, this uh, Bodhisattva Manjushri's 700 line discourse on the perfection of wisdom. That's what we've been talking about for three Sundays now. This is our fourth one. I'm going to dispense with any, you know, any of the formalities. I'm going to dive basically right in. Um, I, I, of course, I'll, I'll bring us back up to speed, but I'm not going to really cover much of the beginning, like the, the story of how we got here. It's not much of a narrative. In that way, it's basically the Bodhisattva Manjushri, crown prince of the Dharma, giving his particular explanation of pranya. Um, and yeah, that's what's going on. And I like this sutra because if you're interested in this idea of pranya, if you're interested in kind of Mahayana Buddhism, this is sort of one of the clearest, the clearest explanations of this idea of, of uh, transcend, transcendent wisdom, transcendental wisdom. You know, there's so many English translations of this word pranya. Um, and even though this is the clearest, it's still a pretty serious idea. It's a pretty heavy concept. And tonight, I actually, we're going to get into some of the more, more um, really specific statements that Manjushri, the sutra, makes about this pranya wisdom. Like, what, what is it? How, how, where? So tonight's sort of the night, um, you know, it'll be, it would be good, obviously. And it looks like a lot of folks are from folks who've come from the previous nights. So obviously if you've been here for the first three nights, this will make a lot more sense. But as usual, I'm kind of into just trying to make each night, you know, self-standing in that way. And so in order to do that, I just need to tell you where we're at in that, this discourse with the Buddha, Manjushri, and Shariputra, these three are having this conversation. And the whole conversation begins with Manjushri saying, well, this is how I see things. This is how I see things. And Shariputra's like, wow, you see him. He's like, wow, that's really, wow. Like, that's very rare. It's very extraordinary for you to be able to see the world that way, to see things that way. And I'm going to begin um, with basically where we ended last time, which was Manjushri making this really great statement that since all sentient beings, and that's, you know, don't get uh, anthropocentric on me, don't take all sentient beings to mean all people. We're talking about all sentient beings. Grasshoppers, cats and dogs, the whole nine, right? So since all sentient beings are empty in nature, bodhisattvas do not seek anuttara samyak sambodhi, the supreme unsurpassable enlightenment to teach sentient beings. And why? And this, this is the big Manjushri line. Because nothing in the Dharma I teach is apprehensible. That's more or less where we left last time with Manjushri making the statement. This is, of course, after a long back and forth with Shariputra and the Buddha, where Manjushri says, well, in the truth, in the Dharma that I'm talking about, there's nothing that you could grab onto, nothing you could hold on to. Wow. <laughs> so 
So that's where we start tonight is in the inapprehensible realm of emptiness. Yeah. And in particular, what we're talking about is this, well, this really kind of, well, it's a wild idea. And again, I, I, I kind of went off on this last time, uh, the session three, I went off on this a lot, so I'm not going to do it tonight. But this is the message of the Vajra, Pranyaparamita Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra. This is the grand message, everybody, of that sutra. That the Buddha says, yeah, 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 but at the end of the day, there's actually no such thing as a sentient being. Even, even though I'm in the business as a Buddha of liberating sentient beings and you, Manjushri, as a Bodhisattva, are in the business of, of, of maturing or saving all sentient beings. And even though we're all in the business of improving the lives and ending the suffering of all sentient beings, at the end of the day, there's actually no such thing as a sentient being. <laughs> That's the theme for tonight. Uh, what I've written up here, this is the thing, the Zheng uh, Sheng Jie, this realm of sentient beings. This is what we're gonna be talking about tonight. We probably will get past this, but this is gonna be the heart of tonight, which is this idea of this mysterious realm of sentient beings, whether they be human or not, because remember, it's not even animals. Hell dwellers, hungry ghosts, gods and demigods are all included in the realm of sentient beings. And so this idea that this sutra is talking about, which is like, yeah, yeah, we, we as bodhisattvas, we're really into the, you know, we're, we're really into the enterprise of saving all sentient beings. Because we know there's no such thing as sentient beings. And that, that paradox is sort of about, uh, is, is what is about to be discussed. And so I just kind of wanted to, to preface tonight before I start reading from the text and getting into all the ideas. It's like, that's what we're talking about is this paradox, this absolute paradox of the realm of sentient beings. So this is our first point for, of tonight. And so I'm just going to start with, you know, the, yeah, yeah, that he makes this statement, Manjushri makes this statement that says, since sentient beings are empty in nature, empty, right? Shunyata, yeah? And in many ways, actually, I think I'll just read it because the text, the text kind of becomes this question and answer anyways. So I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to paraphrase it before it's even happened is, is what I'm saying. So Manjushri makes this statement of, well, you know, since the realm of sentient beings is empty, bodhisattvas actually don't seek enlightenment. They don't seek anuttara samyak sambodhi. They don't seek supreme and surpassable enlightenment. Or they don't teach sentient beings. That's what he says. And bodhisattvas don't teach sentient beings. Huh? What? And why? Because nothing in the Dharma, the truth, nothing in the truth that I teach is apprehensible. And that's, of course, because Manjushri is deep in the, the perfection of wisdom, deep in the Pranyaparamita. And so then the Buddha asked Manjushri, If no sentient being exists, why is it said that there are sentient beings and a realm of sentient beings? That's the Buddha's question. That's where we start tonight. And, and I know that many, because I you know, have met with many of, of you in the room privately, and we have been doing the Dharma doors for years now. I don't even know, but we've been doing this for a while. And so I know many of you have the same question, which is this like, well, if all of these sentient beings are sort of non-existent, empty in nature and all of that, why do we keep talking about sentient beings? What, what is all of this uh, discourse 
about sentient beings. Um, uh, I'll tell you this just because this is for posterity. These things get recorded and go on forever or whatever. So just for posterity's sake, it's very interesting actually that in the Chinese and everybody knows I'm, I'm kind of reading from the Chinese version, comparing it to the English, also comparing it to Edward Cohn's uh, Sanskrit translation of this text. What's interesting is that the Buddha doesn't ask Manjushri, if no sentient beings exist, why is it said that there are sentient beings in a realm of sentient beings? This, the, the Chinese actually is that the Buddha tells Manjushri this. And if you're into the logic, if you're into how, you know, if you're into what I call the tri trialectical or trialectics or the trialectical argument, which is this like, it's kind of a, you know, at least as far as I'm thinking, it's a twist on Plato's dialectical argument because now we have three aspects. And so if you're into that idea that there is a very nuanced discourse going on, a laying out of ideas in a very nuanced way using three characters that represent three stages of enlightenment, then I actually think it's very important to note when someone asks a question versus makes a definitive statement. If this were actual logic, like actual Western um, symbolic you know, logic type of philosophy, it would be of the utmost importance to know if this is a question or a statement. Mm, in the context of the sutra right now, I don't think it really matters, but again, for posterity's sake, I think it's interesting that the Buddha tells Manjushri that if no sentient being exists, it like it's sort of this weird statement that if no sentient being exists, that's why it is said that there is a realm of sentient beings. So leave it to the Buddha to say something even crazier, right? <laughs> Type of a thing. So I, again, I don't want to dwell on it too long, but I just wanted you to know that in my reading of the Chinese, I was like, wait a minute. That's not the character for to ask. That's the character for to tell somebody something. So Manjushri's response, let's say, to the Buddha's comment slash question is that Manjushri answers, well, the realm of sentient beings is by nature identical with the realm of the Buddhas. I don't I mean, we might not get past that tonight, but whatever, right? So there's a lot going on with Manjushri's statement right there. The first thing that I want to touch on tonight is the first thing that I have written on our board, which is this idea of the uh, realm of sentient beings. The word that's being translated as realm is the Sanskrit word datu, D-H-A-T-U, datu. This is just like your realm of desire, your kama datu, your realm of form, your rupa datu, your formless realm, your arupa datu. So this is a datu. And the word datu is sometimes translated as sphere, dimension, realm, you know, I don't know whether you're going like Tolkien fantasy or a little more sci-fi, right? Do you want to be in a realm? Do you want to be in a dimension? It's up to you in that sense, right? But I just wanted to connect that to those ideas of like the realm of desire, the realm of form, the formless realm. And then there's this realm of sentient beings, Look, there's a, this is a realm of sentient beings, right? We're hearing things, we're seeing things, I'm talking. This is very much a realm of sentient beings, a dimension of sentience. Maybe think of it that way, a dimension of sentience, right? And again, for anybody that's really deep in the tri dot to the realm of desire, realm of form and formlessness, apply this idea to now, let, let's just throw a... Um, a sentience realm, 
you know, maybe slide that right in between the realm of desire and the realm of form or something like that, right? So we're talking about this kind of realm of sentience or realm of sentient beings. And the Buddha asks about this, like, well, then why do we even talk about sentient beings or a realm of sentient beings? And Manjushri's response is, well, the realm of sentient beings is identical in nature to the realm of the Buddhas. Yeah, yeah. Let me, I'll, I'll explain that first or give it my best shot because the, the next one's even more interesting. The next question is even more wild. But, and, and you know, logistically, this is a very interesting answer to the question of why we would even speak of a realm of sentient beings or speak of sentient beings at all, because it's identical with the realm of the Buddhas. I'm, I'm not gonna really fully be able to connect that um, as an answer, but I will explain the answer. So I'm not gonna be able to explain the connection very well, but I will explain what the answer is. And that is, you know, if, we, if you go back to last class, to part three, of which I will now quickly summarize. I spent a lot of time last Sunday talking about dependent origination. In particular, I spent a lot of time talking about dependent origination as it pertains to sensory experience. I talked about this, it's a, I used a classic Buddhist example of someone who has a defect in their eye so that when they look at a light, they see a flower or what looks like a, um, you know, like a little aura. And it's a kind of a hallucination, not a hallucination, but it's like a optical illusion where deep in their eye is creating what looks like a light flower floating around the light. And if, there's so, if there were somebody else that didn't have that defect, they would be like, what flower? I don't see any flower. They're looking at the same light, but with different eyes. The, their eyes don't have the cataract or the defect or just the affect of creating this uh, flower. That analogy that the Buddha uses a lot of these um, kind of imaginary things that would appear to somebody that has an eye problem or whatever. The teaching of that is that e all of our eyes have a, pro have a problem in that way, but not a problem. All of our eyes are all of our eyes. And some eyes, when they look at lights, produce flowers. And some eyes, when they look at lights, produce whatever. But the idea is, is that whatever visual phenomena you're experiencing is your own unique mental phenomena that is contingent upon, dependent upon the nature of your eyes, the nature of your ears, the nature of your nose, tongue, body, and ultimately the nature of your conditioned mind to interpret this sort of realm of form, to interpret this information. So just like the person with the cataract, their eye is interpreting the light. And because of the nature of their eye, there appears to be a flower. Again, I went off on this last time. And the point of that was, is that, well, the point of dependent origination is, is that this visual phenomena that you are having is arising due to the contact between your eyes and some object. But what you are experiencing right now here is not the object. You're experiencing your own, um, the conditions of your own sensory organs. Just like that person with the cataract experienced a flower in the sky, and they, here's the real teaching about that, by the way. The person who thinks there's a flower out there and is like, ooh, ooh, gimme, gimme, they're deluded. 
They are chasing phantasms. The person that knows, oh, that's a dependently originated flower because of the cataract in my eye corresponding with the light and it's emerging in the in-between. That's an enlightened mind that understands from whence the flower arises. So if you think I'm over here in my house on a computer, da da da, and you're tuning into me, that's grasping after flowers. If you understand, wow, this is really interesting. This is a dependently originated phenomenon in my mind that appears to be a laptop, Zoom, all of these things. If you understand it's a dependently originated phenomena that's sort of floating in the in-between that isn't actually out there, but isn't entirely just a hallucination. It isn't entirely just in your mind. If you understand that it is an emerging phenomena that happens because of the in-between, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So what I talked about in part three was this emerging of sentient beings. That's the idea. Manjushri says those flowers, inapprehensible. Sentient beings, inapprehensible. And if we keep going with this idea, and I choose my words carefully, if we keep going with this idea, with these ideas, if we keep going with this, what we arrive at, and this is the point in my talk where I just cut to the chase. If we keep going with that, we begin to realize that any and all phenomena, meaning, oh, look, a person, look, a whiteboard, look, uh, it's hot, look, this, whatever it is, whether it be a visual phenomena, an auditory um, a smell, a taste, a tactile sensation, or even some sort of feeling, emotion, love, what have you. All of these are words and ideas and concepts, including Buddha, Buddha land, enlightenment, nirvana, samsara. They're all words. They're all concepts. They're all ideas. And to use the language of the Buddha, they are, sorry, to use the language of Manjushri, they all have the same identical nature, which is that they're all like dependently originated cataract flowers. If you get into that idea that all phenomena are sort of equally dependently originated, they're all kind of equally diluted, but equally happening in so far as they are phenomena, it gets very interesting then to sort of, um, well, to level the world out that way, to level it out to where Buddha, Ordinary person, same nature, same dependently originated nature. To level it all out, that's kind of Manjushri's mode. It is a deluded common person's mode to get excited about Buddhas. Oh, Buddhas, they're so enlightened. They're so pretty. They're so whatever. And ordinary people, oh, I'm so tired of ordinary people and their ideas and their comments. Oh my gosh. And so to make sort of a distinction between ordinary people and Buddhas, yeah, that's the problem. The privileging of one dependently originated phenomena over another. From the, from the eyes of the fully enlightened, it's so full, foolish. It's utterly deluded and foolish to be like, no, not those dependently originated phenomena, these dependently originated phenomena. <laughs> <laughs> They're all dependently originated phenomena. And so the move, as Manjushri says, is this inapprehensibility. The Dharma that he's talking about is, is like, no, 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 no. Don't cling, don't attach, don't rest on anything. Manjushri's answer, again, is the realm of sentient beings is by nature 
identical with the realm of the Buddhas. Everybody feeling okay with that? Yeah, right? By the way, you know, if you've heard of this idea of the Buddha nature, how all beings have Buddha nature, this is why, <laughs> by the way, because there is no difference in nature. Okay, so now we're a little primed. We're a little primed up. Yeah, we got the gears going. So now we can have some fun. Michael, um, then the you, oh yeah. Uh, my my internet is a little bit unstable, so if you don't hear me clearly, then I then I stop. Um, I got you. Do you hear me clearly? Okay, yep. got it. So in contemporary language, could you say that? Um, so how um, Buddhism understands reality um, based on dependent origination. So in, in the materialistic world, they, the materialists say there is a world independent of um, me or consciousness, right? Idealism says, I mean, there are different um, aspects of idealism, but generally speaking, idealism says everything is, um, everything is in your mind, so to speak, right? So in, in, in Buddhism, would you say it's neither materialism nor idealism. So it's this thing in between. There is um, a thing like an outer world, not how you think or you perceive it, but there is something. And when this thing comes in contact with your individual consciousness, the world arises? Question mark? Yep. Um. Everybody get Connie's question, by the way, because it's very profound. It's uh, so she's using uh, and kind of idealism. Idealism is this kind of German philosophical movement that starts, you know, it starts before Hegel, but Hegel's kind of uh, interesting uh, supporter of this idea. The idealism, as it's called, which, like Connie says, is this like it's very it's very close. Connie, it's very close. Um, this idea of idealism that Connie mentions eventually turns into a discipline um, mm, kind of popular, uh, not a discipline, but a, a line of thought popularized by Husserl called phenom uh, phenomenology. Phenomenology, if you're familiar with it, is the closest, in my estimation, it's the closest the West gets to what we're talking about. However, Connie, let me drop this on you. Everybody, let me drop this on you. How about thinking about it like this? So there's this, the conundrum of uh, what Kant called the thing in itself, that, that thing, that thing out there that I may or may not be uh, interpreting or perceiving correctly, right? So that's, that's what we're wrestling against is there's some object in space and I have perceptive organs and I'm wondering to what degree, to what degree does my idea of the thing correspond to the thing? And of course, First, what's problematic about this is that we never get to pop out of our own minds and verify our idea of things. So that quickly turns into idealism or at, at the extreme case, it turns into solipsism where there is only the perceiver and you are actually all in my mind, period. That's solipsism. Idealism is, like Connie said, this idea of like, no, actually what I'm experiencing is just my interpretation of it, and I will never have access to it, but, but, but it, it is what I'm like misperceiving. Let's just maybe label it misperceiving. How about this, Connie? What if it's not about an object that is then being 
um, uh, uh, perceived or not perceived correctly. What if the whole situation, unlike the phenomenologists, unlike the solipsists, unlike all of that, what if it's not a thing, but something closer to an emotion like greed? What I mean by that is, is that what if it is the very emotion of wanting that then divides and creates that which could be wanted and the wanter? And so we're not dealing actually with a problem of things being misinterpreted or understood or whatever, but actually emotional or in, in our psychological language, the best I can come up with is an emotional thing that then produces the idea of things. So could you say like it's uh, what comes to mind would be conditioning? Is it a... Yeah, in, yeah. in a way, but if we understood, if we understand that that conditioning is arising from what I'm calling emotions, greed, anger, and delusion primarily, let's stick to the Buddhist language of the three afflictions, And that is basically what the Buddhist uh, position is, is that it's this kind of like discomfort, greed, wanting, anger or aversion and delusion that then create the whole thing. And what I mean, it, what I guess what I want to do right now, because Connie, your questions are always fire, so good. And I want to like use this opportunity to, to express this idea, which is what if the very idea of objects and things is after some sort of emotional thing? And the West has all wrong because they're so obsessed with objects in that way and not so much the mind. Just putting that up. Everything upside down. <laughs> Leave it to the Buddhists. The yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's a lot of food of thought. <laughs> And we're just getting started. Tanya had her hand up first, then Noam. So basically, if you follow that logic, if you like have like no, if you're in a place where no emotion, where you're completely, you know, then that's where you're merging with everything, right? You're, there's no separation from anything because you don't have that grasping that causes this sort of separateness from me and this other thing, object mm -hmm. self, right? Yep. So, uh, yes. So if you can get to that point where you're just like, totally like, you know, without the emotion, then you're merged with everything. Does that make yes. sense? It, I mean, it's following the logic. It, it, I, it, we're, we're, it is happening tonight because that's exactly right. You just described in your own words, which is the most beautiful way to do it. You described upeksha, equanimity, that idea. And, and that, but what's beautiful, Tanya, is that you explained why, like why we would even want to achieve such a state of, of upeksha. Usually it's just because the Buddha said it's so great that I want to get there. But you were like, oh no, oh, it's that, that levelness that then would not be emotionally disturbed and then would not create a phenomenal world to want. So beautiful, um, Tanya, for summarizing how I twisted it, where I put the emotion first. Beautiful. No? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask what may be an obvious question, but Is this the same? This is the same idea as in the 12 link chain, how grasping creates becoming, right? Like the becoming, that's what you're talking about is becoming. Baba. Baba. Yep. Okay. Which is essence, which as the Chinese translate is being. 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 Meaning like a thing. And so, wow. Wow, Noam to connect the dots and wreck it. because I've been talking about dependent origination every night, but I have yet to really mention the 12 link chain. And so you're exactly putting all the dots together. 
that is exactly that idea of like, oh, the grasping creates the being, mm -hmm. but the grasping came first and I'm calling that emotional mm -hmm. or it's, it's at, at the very least, it's more verbal. It's more a verb than a noun. Connie, let's do that. Screw emotions, screw feelings and all of that. We're talking about verbs rather than nouns. So verbs create nouns in a Bingo. way. Bingo. Now we're really getting somewhere. Yo, this is true. Okay. Is everybody good now? I mean, you should be good now because you just had a, a lot of <laughs> different angles on this one idea. <laughs> Sweet. Because now it gets very interesting, right? So the Buddha then asks, and I believe this one is a question. And, and it's why I bring up before when in the Chinese, the Buddha tell, told Manjushri something, because he doesn't always tell. He does, the Buddha does sometimes inquire. So this time is, the, is one where the Buddha does inquire. And he says, does the realm of sentient beings have a scope? Oh, terrible, terrible. What is this word scope? It's so, the, what, they're, what they are, the, the Chinese, what they're really asking regarding scope is, and it's literally what the Chinese says, is the realm of sentient beings calculable? Is it calculable? And I've mentioned a few times in these talks about the great 2020 census, this effort to count all the human beings in the United States. That would be an in an objective reality where there are an objective world of objective nouns, people, sentient be or human beings living in their dwellings. And you could go door to door and say, how many people live here? Great, thanks. And you could do that and then tabulate it and have a number. We think that's possible, right? <laughs> I, I, I asked the, the group of well-trained Dharma students. Right? That's possible, right? That so that's about human beings. Is the realm of human beings calculable? Can you do a census of human beings? Well, the Buddha asks, not, let's not even talk about human beings. Is the realm of sentient beings calculable? Manjushri's answer is, the realm of sentient beings is identical in calculability, identical in scope, with the realm of the Buddhas. <laughs> he, he does this, he does the same thing. <laughs> he kind of like, well, it's the same as the realm of the Buddhas. Is the realm of the Buddhas calculable? <laughs> Um, by the way, just, uh, yeah, so the next one's even more interesting. Actually, let me do the next one because they're sort of very related and then I'll digress. So then the Buddha asks, does the scope, does the calculability, does the scope of sentient beings realm, does the calculability of the realm of sentient beings have a location? I'll save, I'll save Manjushri's answer for one mo moment. So those two things about the calculability of the realm of sentient beings or the, the, yeah, the realm of sentient beings and then the location of sentient beings. If you've been paying attention to my, my earnest attempt to explain dependent origination and how we each have a unique MC Owens in our minds, right? And that's just the realm of MC Owens's, let alone the realm of all the human beings, let, a realm, let alone the realm of all the sentient beings that are being dependently originated in the minds of all other sentient beings. 
I, my mind gets dizzy already trying to calculate the number of those he, just the MC Owens is 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 is, uh, is incalculably many, let alone the all the human beings, let alone the realm of sentient beings. Right? <laughs> if if you understood about the dependently originated nature of all these things, calculability is off the table. <laughs> right? So that's about the calculability. And then this one about do they have a location? Now, right, right away, if you're following this, you should be like, whoa, like, yeah, where are those sentient beings located? Where are those cataract flowers located? You remember my example of the cataract flower, right? Is it in the air in front of the person with the cataract? Is it in the eye of the person with the cataract? Is it in the light? Where? Where is it? <laughs> and if you are like, basically, if you're kind of sitting in a mind of dependent origination and you're kind of like, uh, uh, like if you, have, you don't have a good answer for where, where these things are, the best I come up with is in the in-between. <laughs> where is in the in-between, right? Where exactly is that located? That's just a, a, con a convenient uh, language. Manjushri, the realm, or sorry, the calculability of the realm of sentient beings is inconceivable. That's the answer. It's inconceivable. <laughs> that should be crystal clear. What I mean by that, if it's not crystal clear, is that to go around thinking there's an objective world that's calculable and to go around and count up all the human beings and put it into a computer and tabulate and result, that is very conceivable. It's very, very conceivable. <laughs> when you're in the realm of, of the dependently originated, where, and I haven't done this to you tonight yet, so I'm about to do it. In the realm of dependent origination, where not only is the cataract flower a dependently originated phenomena, you, the observer, the very notion of Michael, Noam, Tanya, whoever, the very notion of that is also a dependently originated phenomena with dependently originated eyeballs, with dependently originated cataracts. With depend it just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And so the, that's inconceivable. When I'm me with my brain, and my my calculator, I can do all the conceiving you want to do. Con conceivability is on the table. As soon as you're in the realm of the dependently originated, where everything starts to get a little like, well, dependent on everything else, conceivability starts to begin be get it starts to be become a little tricky. <laughs> and so just again, the calculability, the scope of sentient beings, the, or the calculability of the realm of sentient beings is inconceivable. Everybody good on that. So that's going to conclude the first point I wanted to get to tonight, which is this realm of sentient beings, what they're talking about, the word realm, all that. Everybody good? And if, if you're sort of like, I don't know, I kind of maybe have a question. I just want you to know that, you know, this part of the sutra, and in many ways, this whole sutra, it just keeps rolling along. And at no point is it really, at least in my estimation, it's not getting more complicated. It's actually like, well, what if we look at it from this way? 
what if we look at it from this way? What if we look at it from this way? So we're not kind of ascending some sort of logical ladder. We're actually just trying to approach this from a lot of different angles. So, so then the Buddha asks, does the realm of sentient beings abide anywhere? And this is going to be, let's see, this is this, that character, Jewel, uh, Z-H-U, if you wanted to look it up in a Chinese pinyin dictionary, Z-H-U, Jewel. This is this word for abide. I can't tell, I can't stress enough how significant this idea is to Buddhism to abide. The original, and I've mentioned this in past Dharma talks, but it's always good to repeat these things. The original kind of language of an abode is sort of like, well, you could go back to the Brahma Viharas, these, uh, um, the meditation on metta, loving kindness, karuna, compassion, mudita, empathic joy, and then our aforementioned upeksha. These are, this is an old strata of meditation, goes way back. And those Brahma viharas, and if you remember, if you recall, or if you know, vihara is like, well, the word sort of conventionally means actually like a monastery, but it actually originally meant kind of like a forest dwelling, a forest abode, a vihara. A vihara was like a, a place to meditate. And the Buddhists would talk about going to the Brahma viharas. The, 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 the viharas of Brahma, the god. And these were these like, they, they are actually often called heavenly abodes. And so the idea was in early Buddhism is that I am currently abiding in my apartment, in my house. I'm currently abiding here. But if I do meditation and meditation on loving kindness, I can kind of elevate, if I want to use that direction, I can elevate myself to the first Brahma Vihara, the first heavenly abode. And I can be abiding in the realm of metta. And then I could be abiding in the realm of compassion and I could be abiding in the realm of mudita. And there's actually in early Buddhism, all kinds of abodes, these meditative states where you're hanging out, <laughs> you're abiding. That's old school Theravada Buddhism or old school Shravakayana, Hinayana Buddhism. When the Vajra Sutra comes on the scene, when the Buddha drops the Vajra on us, he says, Bodhisattvas do not abide. Unlike the dude, Unlike the dude who abides, the bodhisattva has no abode. They do not rest here, there, or anywhere. So when the Buddha asks Manjushri, does the realm of sentient beings abide anywhere? That's like... That's kind of what he's asking, or that's sort of what he, you know, the Buddha knows everything. So these are all, you know, just to get things going, of course. But the Buddha asks, so does the realm of sentient beings abide anywhere? So it might, it might not be located anywhere, but does it abide somewhere? Because I, I say this because those Brahma Viharas were not locations. You could not point to where the first Brahma Vihara is, but you could claim to abide 
in the first Brahma Vihara. So this, this language is very uh, tricky, very, you know, uh, significant. This is where it gets so fun. <laughs> Manjushri's answer to that question is sentient beings abide nowhere just like space. <sighs> okay, so this is a fun one. So this is our Akasha space. I have done many a Dharma talk on Akasha or space. It does not mean outer space. It does not mean black void of space. Space is this very subtle, I, I dare not call it a thing. I dare not call it a dimension. I dare not kind of call it anything because space is this, what I call, what I do dare is to call it an allowance that space allows for the existence of phenomena, but space itself is not a phenomena. And so again, space is, the, is this. Why is my thumb not my index finger? Because there's space between them. <laughs> if there was no space between them, I would have some sort of deformity where my index finger and thumb were the same thing because they're occupying the same space. But because they're not occupying the same space, I can conceptually, phenomenally distinguish them. You can distinguish me from the whiteboard because there's space, all of these things. And then it gets really subtle, of course, because like I'm, I'm me, right? I'm, I'm one thing. But if you wanted to draw a distinction between my face and my hand, you would have to, to conceptually create space between them, distinguish them, separate them. Oh, his face is one thing, his hand is another. A moment ago, they were all one Michael, but now I've created space. So the reason why I'm going through all of this is because positive objects and then space. Space isn't a thing, but it allows for them. <laughs> Manjushri just said, basically that sentient beings are like space, are, are, are like the other thing. Not the, not the solid positive part, but all the realm of sentient beings is, is, well, it abides nowhere like space. They abide nowhere like space. It's about to get really, really interesting. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Any questions or comments or ideas, concerns about this space, all sentient beings abide nowhere, just like space. Sweet, sweet. So. Michael, quick question. Rocket Dean. Um, would, would a Bodhisattva occupy some space or do they work in a different way somehow? Uh, yeah, that's a great, tricky, good, great question. I would dare say that a, any Bodhisattva worthy of the title Bodhisattva does not occupy any space and what I mean by that, of course, is that to attach to this sentient being, that is to be clinging, that is to be an ordinary person, clinging to this space, or, or pardon the misuse of the term, this object in space, 
not that, not that, not that, this. The Buddha, Manjushri are saying, yo, that's a delusion. That's an utter delusion to think that you're there and I'm here. It's about dependent origination. All things are arising in the in-between. Uh, Dean, including your relationship to yourself, those are all dependently originated. And insofar as they are dependently originated, they, like the cataract flower, you can't, say it it, you can't say it is anywhere. The bodhisattva, by definition, is a sattva, a being who understands, oh, I'm not just here. I'm kind of <laughs> everywhere and nowhere. I, it gets tricky as far as like, I'm everywhere and nowhere, or I'm just nowhere or whatever, but I am definitely not just here, says the Bodhisattva. So in answer to your question, does the Bodhisattva occupy space? I would say not if they're a Bodhisattva. Thank you. <laughs> Great question. So Michael, if I understand it correctly, space gives birth to, uh, to dependent origination is mm. or allows it. Is space prior to dependent origination or is there no linear linear growth wow Ooh. wow <laughs> can you're I making me there? work you're making me work tonight can i jump in there yeah is it in the in is it the in between wow what is the relationship between space and dependent origination um If, if, if grasping is what creates being, is what gives rise to being, which is the separate. Yeah. So, yep. Me and the object. And space yep. affords that. Then wow. does grasping all, also give rise to space? Yes, no. Ultimately, yes. Um, yeah. So, What's really, yeah, Connie, man, wow, what a great question. What is the relationship or what between space and dependent origination? Noam said it. I was trying to construct some sort of fancy, you know, sentence or something. But the idea, you know, what I would like to draw your attention to is that whenever this phrase comes up, um, whatever, that uh, all sentient, the realm of sentient beings or whatever, abide nowhere, just like space. I've been looking, you know, I've been studying this for a while, I look into this, and this is always the caveat when the Buddha or a Bodhisattva compares things to space, the, which is the Akasha space that I was talking about, they always say like space. And as far as I understand what they're doing there is that it's pure upaya finger pointing at the moon, which is that if I as a good Dharma teacher or if a Bodhisattva or whoever can really get you to, to like understand that elusive weird nature of space the buddha or bodhisattva wants you to know that all that ascension beings realm of ascension beings all phenomena is like that it's not that and so the answer to your question connie is yeah is that yes and noam said it space is another idea another concept dependently originated and it's it's dependent upon objects equally the, the, the very notion of space that I dropped on you, the space between my thumb and my index finger is dependent upon my thumb and my index finger. So the limitations of that space, the, the confines of that space, very dependently originated. 
And so, yes, Connie, at the, at the end of the day, dependent origination is this really um, deep, 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 deep idea about what's going on here that even explains space. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So now hopefully we're all good on space, that things are like space, but not space, they're like that. And so Manjushri answers with this one, sentient beings abide nowhere, just like space. The Buddha asked Manjushri, if so, how should one abide in the paramita of wisdom when cultivating it. So that's that's one of those sentences where like, if you were just kind of on your own reading this, it, it, it might not make a lot of sense or it just might be like a lot of confusing words in a way. But when I just went through my my little spiel about abiding in the realm of metta or karuna mudita or abiding in here or abiding there the manjush or sorry the buddha's you know again he knows he know, the buddha knows but his leading question here is like oh okay so when you are when one is practicing this pranya paramita where do they abide? And again, this is not a location question. It's a meditation abiding question. Manjushri's answer, which I have three giant exclamation points next to in my edition here. Manjushri's answer is abiding in no Dharma is abiding in the Paramita of Wisdom. So now I'm on to my third point. We kind of jumped over the realm of sentient beings, not having an abode, went through that quickly. But this idea that to not abide in any dharma, that is to abide in the paramita of wisdom. If, if you're just a, a logic head, you're like, wait, wait that's abiding like you know but if you get the message and and this is a point where in case you know you you don't know this word dharma of course is complicated it means a lot of things it means truth it means teaching it means principle but it also can just mean phenomena like i've been using this word phenomena all night the phenomena of my hand, the phenomena of a flower, the phenomena of a whiteboard, whatever, the, any, any phenomena can be called a dharma. And so Manjushri says that to not abide in any dharma, that is to abide in the paramita of wisdom. And I actually, the, 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 actually the more profound, the deeper profound meaning of no phenomena, meaning nothing, abiding, resting on nothing. That's the paramita of wisdom. Translating Dharma as any given phenomena, anything, that. That, that, that's one interpretation of it. That's one meaning of it. And it might be the more profound meaning. But I want to take a couple steps back only because of where this is going. This is going to start using the language of, let's see, da, 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 where, well, at some point, this is going to start using the language of the Dharma of ordinary people. And in that instance, it's not necessarily referring to the little d dharmas of phenomena. What 
Mm. Yeah, I want to I want to articulate this. Please don't forget everything I said about little didharmas, meaning phenomena, because it's definitely still in play. But there is a sort of a significance to this word dharma that you should be aware of. And it's along the lines of the word dharma, meaning a teaching. But, you know, it's kind of like. Well, you know, you could substitute dharma for like, well, you could substitute it with a lot of things. Um, The dharma of Christianity, for example. The dharma of Christianity says that the world was created by God and then God sent his only begotten son to die for the sins of the world da, 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 and to accept that is to be saved da, 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 da. that's the dharma of christianity that is the truth that they're telling you the material scientists are telling you that it's a chemical uh kind of crazy reaction big bang uh uh, you know, primordial swamp soup, lightning bolt, life, da 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 da. That's what's going on here. Uh, da, da, da. That's the Dharma of science. And there's all these different Dharmas, these different truths about what's going on here, how you should live your life, why you should live your life a certain way, what you should believe, what you shouldn't believe. All of these teachings or truths. We might call them religions or whatever, but we dare not call science a religion. (laughs) But all these teachings or truths are dharmas. And I, I wanted to make that point because then for Manjushri's to say that abiding in no deep teaching, abiding in no truth, abiding in no religion, abiding in nothing, that's to abide in the paramita of wisdom. Oh, that's that. Whoa. Oh, that, you know, so that becomes very tricky, especially if you're trying to make your way in the world and you're like, you know, reading books and you're trying to listen to teachers and you're trying to figure out what's going on here. And you got this person over here saying like, come over here and, you know, I'll sprinkle water on your head and you'll be saved. Come on, come on, come on. And then these people over here are saying, no, no, five times a day, face that way and bow down. No, that'll do it. And then these people over here are saying, no, 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 maximize pleasure, minimize pain. And then these people, so everybody's got a dharma. Everybody's got a teaching or a truth about what's going on here. And Manjushri says, well, to to not rest on any truth, to not rest on any one, that is to abide in the paramita of wisdom. Everybody good with that? Yeah, I kind of took it as like, you know, because you brought this up before in other sutras, like don't even cling to or abide too much in Buddhism. Exactly. So again, like, hold, yeah. So that would be like one of the dharmas too. Exactly. Exactly. And that's where it's even, it's like even more profound, like really, really practicing what they're preaching in that sense that they say, yeah. And even this paramita paramita of wisdom, if you find yourself kind of resting and abiding here, you missed it. You lost. To have no view. To no, have no view. No view, no this you connect, you're connecting the dots. Exactly. And I, I hope everybody, at least everybody in the Zoom room here, is like excited by that. Is like, oh wow, and not daunted by that. Because I can understand how one might be daunted by that idea of like, wait, you mean I can never like latch on to something as totally true forever and for always, and then use that as my benchmark to go forward with the rest of my life. And it's kind of like, no, (laughs) I mean, you could, but this teaching is about being ever, ever like, you know, curious in a way, 
always ready, always ready to abandon what you thought you knew for something new. It's like always ready to uh, listen. Actually, it's a big part of the practical application of this is that when people, it, it tends to happen that when people find their dharma and then are like, all right, this is bedrock. It is upon this rock that I shall build my church. And then they go forward. There's a tendency to start not really listening to other ideas because I got it. And then of course that becomes really problematic when your parents gave this bedrock to you when you were a child, right? So I just want to say, and I'm not, you know, I'm a Dharma teacher, so I have to celebrate the Dharma, but I don't mean to throw anybody under the bus or anything like that, because I'm throwing them all equally under an empty bus. So. My friend, your point of view, um, do we need to understand the Dharma um, in order to be able to drop the Dharma? Or in other words, do we need to walk? I mean, need whatever need means, but do we do does one need to walk the path in order to understand there is no path to walk ultimately you know what i'm saying i yeah. i do i think i know what you're saying and it affords me a great opportunity to articulate what i think the buddhists are talking about when they talk about these protekya buddhas these solitary enlightened beings if you have heard about the Pratekya Buddha, the solitary enlightened one, and the Buddha puts the Pratekya Buddha above the Shravaka, the Hinayana monk or nun that is a follower, they're sort of down here following the Buddha. Whatever the Buddha says, I'll do. That's a Shravaka. The Pratekya Buddha is a solitary enlightened one. And I would actually say, Connie, that a Pratekya Buddha is what you're describing, which is someone who gets this, sees this, doesn't, is, is like, oh yeah, it's all BS or whatever. So I'm not going to rest on any of this. That's the move. Bye, everybody. I'm going to be over here not resting on anything. <laughs> And so to answer your question, Connie, it does seem that in the Dharma, there is sort of a, uh, that it is sort of like, I don't want to see necessary or anything like that, but there is a path, the path, which it kind of begins with this understanding, but it is then matured and matured, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Kinda. Yeah. I mean, I only can drop the Dharma um, when I understand the Dharma. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I don't understand the Dharma, then I can't drop the Dharma or a teaching. <laughs> yes. You know? No, no. And that is that, you know, that famous line that where the Buddha says that my teachings are like a raft. They are like a raft. And that as right. soon as you get over the other side, it's only a fool that takes the raft with them. Yeah, and but we need the raft to go to the other side of the- Exactly, okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. Thank you, yes. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Is, is it, sorry, one little thing. Is it also though, what Manjushri is saying is that it's, it's not that you ignore the Dharma, it's that you don't cling to it, you don't, sort of elevate it to some kind of thing beyond what it is. It's only true in as much as it is applicable, maybe. You know, the boat was great. You don't like chop the boat up and light a fire with it when you get to the other side. You know? Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, exactly. I guess you send it back so other people can come over with that. <laughs> or, and, or, and, you know, respect it as a raft. Yeah, 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 yeah but nothing more than that raft in that way. Yeah. Okay, so let's try to get through a few more lines of this. These are, again, this is all uh, kind of um, dancing around the same idea. So Manjushri's triple exclamation point answer was that 
abiding in no dharma, that's abiding in the parameter of wisdom. The Buddha asked again, man, asked Manjushri further, why is abiding in no dharma called abiding in the parameter of wisdom? <laughs> And I got to tell you, and I'm not, I'm not going to dwell on this for long at all. Um, yeah, because it's just, it's just too much to open up tonight. But regarding the Vajra Sutra that I keep referencing, regarding a lot of the Mahayana Sutras that I, I teach and I talk about, this question about, well, then why is it called that? This is a big thing in... Mahayana Buddhism, which is that they are so very aware of language and, and like things being called something. I, again, I can't like, I don't want to go off on this for too long. Um, yeah, there's, I, I would, I would actually <laughs> go, I would go way too long. But it is on, it's just this idea about, um, well, to use some modern Western philosophical language, it's about like the sayable, that which can be spoken about. And the, the unsayable. Uh, we, we have this fancy word, ineffable it's you can't talk about it so we have this idea of the ineffable or the unsayable and the that which can be spoken about the sayable what's interesting of course is that by calling it the unsayable <laughs> guess what you just did guess what you just did you brought it right back into the realm of the sayable by calling it something. So you never actually get to ineffability. You never actually get to the unsayable. And this is something that's very um, important in Western metaphysics. This relationship between the ineffable and the, the sayable and how how would we even ever talk about that which is ineffable? It's like you, you kind of run into like a cul-de-sac of, of meaning or whatever. And so what I, again, I don't want to go off on this because I know not everybody's really interested in this, but this is a very interesting question when it's like, oh, okay, so there's no abiding or whatever, but then why do we call it? Why is abiding in no dharma whatsoever called abiding in the parameter of wisdom? And Manjushri's even more profound answer is because to have no lakshana, to have no characteristics, qualities, signs, or marks, which this text unfortunately translates as notion. Because to have no notion, to have no lakshana of abiding is to abide in the paramita of wisdom. And I guess I made my attempt to talk about the sayable and the unsayable or the ineffable to like bring us to this point, which is okay. I've got the, I got the ineffable right over here. It's, or it's right up there, right off screen. I've got the ineffable. <laughs> and it's like, oh, great. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? What, I, I, describe to me the ineffable, <laughs> right? This is what I was hinting at a moment ago, which is that any attempt to describe the ineffable immediately pulls it into the realm of the sayable and you are no longer in the realm of the ineffable. 
So this subtle relationship between something, the ineffable, ascension being, a Buddha, whiteboard, a dude, that subtle relationship between any given thing and then the lakshana or characteristics and qualities that make up that thing. That is the, that's the subtle step that we've taken with this next question. Or answer, I should say. And it's, it's, it's tricky or arguably nonsensical or at least, you know, whatever for Manjushri to answer the Buddha. So why, why is abiding in no Dharma called abiding in the Paramita? Like, so that cool thing, that cool thing where you don't attach to any Dharma. Yeah. That's abiding in, that's abiding in the Paramita of wisdom. The Buddha's like, well, why do you call it abiding then? And Manjushri answers because to have no lakshana, no notion of abiding is to abide in the paramita of wisdom. So now we're not even talking about the paramita of wisdom. We're talking about the very idea of abiding. <laughs> that, he says, to have no, no notion, idea, or concept of even abiding. Forget about all the other stuff I've mentioned. Even forget about pranya paramita even to have no notion of abiding, that's to abide in the paramita of wisdom, right? Because to have no notion of abiding is to abide in the paramita of wisdom. The Buddha asked Manjushri further, if one thus abides in the paramita of wisdom, ah, mm, this was another one where the Buddha doesn't ask, he actually says, he tells, and it's important. So the Buddha then tells Manju Sri, if one thus abides in the paramita of wisdom, good roots will neither increase nor decrease. The that language to good roots increasing or decreasing that is at the very heart of the early buddhist tradition the very heart and essence of the shravaka hinayana movement is to cultivate good roots generosity kindness meditation tranquility all of those wholesome activities. All those wholesome activities generate good roots in the mind that then turn into flowers of the mind. And if you have bad roots, greed or anger, those roots should be cut off so that they do not become weeds in the garden of your mind. That is the early uh, Hinayana program, increase good roots, decrease bad roots. And at a certain point in the program, if you get rid of all the bad roots and you have just this pure good roots garden, you're in our hut. Increase good, decrease bad. It's so black and white that it's it's pitfall should be obvious to you right but i digress because i never ever want to bad mouth the the early program because i do think people should cultivate good roots and not cultivate bad roots i, I yeah absolutely it would be a, a better world if that happened but that's in the realm of sentient beings with brains and minds moving in a realm of sentient beings that has a location and an abode and all of that. So yeah, if we're in the world where I think I'm me and I think you're you and all of that, yes, cultivate good roots. <laughs> Don't cultivate bad roots. Yeah. But we're not in that realm anymore. 
We're not in the realm of sentient beings anymore, bodhisattvas. We're non-abiding bodhisattvas. Non-abiding, right? And so when the Buddha asked, well, if one thus abides in the paramita of wisdom, good roots will neither increase nor decrease. So the Buddha is feigning, I would say he's feigning, a little bit of concern here, where it's like, but wait, if people don't, you know, if you don't do the abiding practice, good roots won't increase or decrease and will never become arhats. <laughs> right? Manjushri, an Manjushri answered, if one thus, and by thus, refer to my whole Dharma talk tonight, <laughs> that way, the non-clinging way. So one who thus cultivates, or sorry, one who thus abides in the paramita of wisdom, good roots will neither increase nor decrease, nor will any Dharma, nor will the paramita of wisdom wisdom increase or decrease in nature or characteristic world honored one this is the second part of manjushri's answer world honored one one who thus cultivates the paramita of wisdom will not reject the dharmas of ordinary people nor cling to the dharma of arhats and sages or saints and sages. And why? Because in the light of the paramita of wisdom, there is no dharmas to cling to or to reject. I already mentioned we were gonna, we were gonna be introduced to this idea of the dharma of ordinary people. And I, I, I kind of prefaced us or got us ready for that because of this idea that one who thus cultivates the paramita of wisdom will not reject the dharmas of ordinary people nor cling to the dharmas of the Buddhas, dharmas of the saints and sages. And so that, that's like, that's it. I always say that, right? That's it. But, but that, I mean, that's so wonderfully subtle, right? So let me attempt to unpack it for you. So first of all, I, I, I lean into this word thus. If one thus abides in the paramita of wi wisdom, if one thus cultivates the paramita of wisdom. The inclusion of that word thus, uh, it's not on my whiteboard tonight, but the inclusion of that word thus is this very important reference to tathata, tathagata, thusness. It's like, it's very relevant and significant this language of abiding thus. Okay, so I just want to point that out. And then this idea that if one thus abides in the paramita of wisdom, good roots will neither increase nor decrease, nor will any dharma. Ah, oh, once again, we are confronted with this word dharma. They're using it in an even different way than they were using it before. And, you know, I've said this before, I, you know, it's why I, I like, I appreciate when Buddhist texts just leave it as Dharma. I don't like when they translate it as truth or principle or teaching or capital L law, which is a really popular one, the law. And the reason why is because is if you settle, I'm not actually trying to be cute, but if you settle on any one translation of it, you're going to miss all the other ones. And the thing about Sanskrit is, is that this word Dharma has all these connotations 
and the Buddhists and the sutras and the Buddhist texts, they're playing with all of those meanings at once. And so if you decide on one, you're going to miss all the other ones. So this one. So good roots will neither increase nor decrease, nor will any dharma, and nor, nor will the paramita of wisdom. So this is the kind of, um, yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's one of those things when, when you're, when you're, when you've been doing this long enough, it's just, dar the word dharma is really second nature to you. But the idea is, is that there's another way in which the Buddhists, the early Hinayana, Shravakayana, the early Buddhist program, there's a way in which they use this word Dharma. And it is to refer to these sort of um, attainments. They are actually in English called attainments, like attaining the stage of a stream enterer, attaining the stage of a once returner, attaining the stage of a non-returner, attaining arhatship. In the context of early Buddhism, arhatship is a dharma. Being a once returner is a dharma. So I, I know that those are tricky, like the, those ideas, but I, I I don't want to dwell on them too long, but I just want you to know that that's what the sutra is talking about, is those kinds of dharmas, attainment dharmas, accomplishments, progress, the decreasing of bad roots and the increasing of good roots, cultivation. I used to be stupid, now I'm smart. That's the idea that's being talked about here is... is um, Oh my gosh. I mean, they're just talking about change. <laughs> they're talking about going from one to one state to the next in that way. And so this idea of achieving a dharma such as our hotship or something, this is basic and so uh, to put this all together, if you cultivated good roots and you got rid of all your bad roots, then in the early Hinayana tradition, if you got rid of all the bad roots and it got all good roots, you would achieve the Dharma of Arhatship. And you would no longer be a once returner, non returner, stream enterer, ordinary person, or all of that. You would be an Arhat. That, you would have attained that Dharma. By the way, a lot of the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, a lot of the Diamond Sutra is about the attaining of the Dharma of Supreme Unsurpassable Enlightenment. They, the questions that Subhuti, Subhuti is the monk in that Sutra, he's always asking, well then, how do you attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi? What, what Dharma is that? And the Buddha's like, no, 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 no to totally understand and not cling to any dharma, that is supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. <laughs> and so to tie that together, if one thus abides in the paramita of wisdom, good roots will neither increase nor decrease, nor will any dharma, nor will the paramita of wisdom increase or decrease. You will not get any wiser or any stupider, right? It will not increase or decrease in nature or characteristic. There's been so many great questions and, and all this discourse that that should be obvious now. Like what's going on? That That's like, yeah, right? <laughs> Good roots, bad roots, how discriminatory are we going to get? How discriminatory do we want to get? My good roots, your bad roots, right? How discriminatory are we going to get in all of this? Versus 
not doing that. And of course, <laughs> the very idea of a self sentient being increasing good roots or bad roots, practicing pranyaparamita, all of that should be completely off the table in light of the wisdom of dependent origination. Because we understand that this is all happening nowhere and that there's nobody to be having this experience in that way. World honored one, one who thus, like we just talked about, one who thus cultivates the paramita of wisdom will not reject the dharmas of ordinary people nor cling to the dharmas of the Buddhas. And why? Because in light of this paramita of wisdom, there are no dharmas to cling to or reject. At this point in the sutra, the Big Bang, conventional science, nirvana, enlightenment, all words, all ideas, all discriminatory thought patterns, and to basically to cling to one or reject one, that's the problem. We are too much in the business of going around clinging and rejecting things. And so to be the bodhisattva is to neither cling to nor reject anything. It is, it is oh my gosh, wow, we're past time. I'm gonna take us further to make this point and then I'll, and then I'll bring it to a close. If you didn't notice, there was this subtle introduction of akasha space sometimes called infinite space you've heard of infinite space haven't you it's the first formless abode it's the first formless realm of the four formless jhanas right what's the fourth formless realm the state of neither perception nor non-perception. Let's just summar let's just uh, summarize that down to neither nor. This sutra just took us on a journey through the four, arguably the four, but at least those two, those formless realms. It introduced the idea of space and said, yeah, all sentient beings and the abode of sentient beings is like space. How are you feeling about that? Well, get ready because we're about to go to neither nor, neither attaching nor rejecting. That's where the Bodhisattva abides 24 7, 3, 6, 5 in the state of neither nor. And it is not some deep meditative state with your eyes closed in a zendo. It is a state of mind that neither clings to nor rejects any Dharma, any phenomena, any teaching, any truth, any wisdom, any law. You don't cling to it, but you don't reject it. That is to cultivate the paramita of wisdom. See how I did that? Just ended it. <laughs> only 10 11 minutes after but that's it questions answers comments or ideas obviously we're going to keep going with this next sunday sunday after that so if, Yay. so if they're big <laughs> questions please hold on to them but if they're very pointed questions Right on. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. <laughs> my pleasure. Sorry for going long. You know me. No. Carried away. Thank you, Michael. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Bye.